All right, everyone should be getting a consent option. Go ahead and click yes or continue, and then we can go ahead and get started. So my name is Carlo Martin. I'm with VH Corporation, acting as one of the research coordinators for the Pearl trial uh, that is being sponsored and managed by Aegis Rx, where Dr. Z is co-founder, operator, and one of the most licensed physicians we probably have in the country right now. Uh, Dr. Z, do you want to go ahead and take it? And your slides are already being presented, just to give you a heads up. Perfect. All right. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you for everybody for being here tonight. I'm excited to present this. Um, some of you may have already uh, seen some of these slides. Uh, you know, there was that recording, the presentation I made a few months ago with the, um, uh, the, uh, the LEAF uh, Foundation uh, having, having a, invited me to present. So some of, some of it will be, uh, you know, familiar if you've watched that already, uh, but there's definitely be some new material here. So, uh, don't, uh, don't go to sleep just yet. Uh, all right, so let's just jump in. I tend to speak a little bit quickly. Uh, thankfully, it's recorded, uh, and we can make the uh, slides available as well. Um, so you know, if, if there's something that wasn't clear, please feel free to ask, feel free to ask, and also the recording will be available. Uh, but I have about 70 slides and probably about 50 minutes. So, all right. Um, all right, here we go. So who am I? Um, you know, uh, I'm just make a brief. So I'm a physician. Um, I got I got interested in uh, functional medicine or holistic medicine pretty early on. Um, you know, really had a passion for trying to find the root cause of uh, disease. And um, as, as a lot of people know in the community, um, uh, premature aging is the ultimate cause of a lot of our, our diseases. Um, I'm as, as Carla mentioned, I'm licensed in all 50 states. Probably one of the few physicians in the country who are. Um, I, I started that journey a few years ago, kind of seeing that telemedicine is becoming a trend. I had no idea the pandemic will accelerate telemedicine uh, and, and kind of uh, bring it to the forefront. I've, I've worked with uh, several, you know, well-known telemedicine companies out there. Uh, you know, like I started out with like Teladoc and Amwell, you know, did, did some work with Hims and the Pill Club. And then I uh, co-founded AsiaSRX. Uh, we launched uh, as Qualitude. Um, a little over a year ago, and uh, we're, we've been growing ever since. Uh, so our research team, um, you know, we have Carlo, uh, we have uh, Varsha, uh, and um, Dr. Watson is our principal investigator um, out of the UCLA. He's a professor there. And, uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Wooters, uh, who um, helped um, uh, do a lot of the uh, background research and protocol rep reporting and things like that. All right, so um, you know, premature aging is the ultimate cause of disease. We talked about that, uh, and um, you know, uh, finding that passion to, to treat root causes of disease is actually kept me in medical school. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be a doctor today if I didn't if I didn't discover this 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 kind of field of medicine. Um, Asia Sarex, uh, like I said, launched about a, a little over a year ago. We changed our name a few months ago, um, and we've been growing ever since. We're um, we're listed as a public benefit corporation. Um, that that just means that we're kind of mission driven. Um, we, uh, we provide, you know, we currently provide prescription therapies, uh, but, you know, uh, we're funding uh, research. Um, we'll, be, we'll be, you know, funding a lot of other initiatives on the future. Longevity, you know, I, I don't think I have to choose longevity very much, but basically it's the idea of kind of biohacking or finding various different therapies to enhance not only living longer, but also living healthier. Um, and then, you know, currently on, on, on our platform, we offer metformin, you know, NAD replacement, lotus and Lotrexone. We recently launched Tadalafil, which, um, which is an erectile dysfunction medication, but actually there's some, there's some indication it potentially has some um, uh, benefits for longevity as well. Again, we, we hope to kind of research that a little bit further. Uh, and then, um, you know, a lot of people have been asking us about other therapies like rapamycin, desatinib, uh, other synolytics, things of that nature. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of those are um, um, experimental uh, and the dosings for, health, for healthy humans haven't really been well-defined. And so this Pearl trial, we'll talk a little bit about this, but the Pearl trial will allow us to build the infrastructure to start looking at some of these more uh, potentially stronger and more promising um, uh, therapies. Um, doc, uh, Dr. Nir Barzilai, I'm sure a lot of you know him, uh, he, you know, he, he made a statement that the wide, wide public should be involved, actively involved evaluating uh, evaluation studies, not just as test subjects, but as active and powerful citizen scientists. And, and we're kind of taking that and, um, and, and running with it. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, PEARL stands for Participatory Evaluation of Aging with Rapamycin for Human Longevity. Um, you know, a, lot, a lot of times you want to name uh, your study so it uh, has, has a good acronym. Um, 
what is rapamycin? Um, it's, uh, it's an FDA approved medication. It's currently approved mostly uh, for use with transplant um, uh, patients. Um, it was just, it was isolated from bacteria from Easter Island. Um, at a, at a daily relatively high dose, it's actually an immune suppression, hence the use with the uh, uh, transplant patients, um, but also has some, some uh, unwanted effects on glucose and insulin dysregulation. At, in, at lower and intermittent dosing, it actually has the opposite effect. Uh, it enhances the immune system, we think, uh, as well as uh, induces autophagy and actually can help with uh, insulin and glucose uh, regulation. Uh, so, so it's a matter of finding the right dose, and, and nobody really knows what the right dose is for human longevity. There's a lot of, there's a lot of theories, there's a lot of extrapolation, there's a lot of opinions out there, uh, but there's, you know, there's very little uh, uh, research trials um, on humans. Uh, no, very few, if any, you know, randomized controlled trials with placebos and things like that. Um, so rapamycin, I mean, um, you have, you know, you have mTOR, and then you have the, the mTORC1 and mTORC2 complex, and this kind of this uh, this delicate balancing act between inhibiting mTORC1 versus or, or TORC1 versus TORC2, um, and you can see that you know TORC1 is involved in uh, uh, you know uh, protein synthesis, translation, nutrient sensing, and support, um, and autophagy, and, and so it's kind of like a double negative. If you block mTORC1, you you stimulate autophagy. Um, but you know you don't want to mess with um, you know the torque two. Uh, that's kind of where the uh, it's thought that the insulin reg dysregulation and the immune suppression starts to come in. Um, so you do have to be careful with those, and that's the reason why we're doing this under, under an IRB approved um, uh, protocol. Um, so here's a graphic I pulled from uh, molecular cancer therapeutics. Um, it, it actually involves this this uh, a PLD inhibitor, but I thought the graphic was very nice, so I thought I'd share it. Um, basically, um, you know, like I said, you want the torque one, but not the torque two. Um, it, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. It all, all it always is, <laughs> um, but this is just kind of a, a, a basic basic overview. Uh, and then you have various different uh, enzymes and proteins and things like that. Like for example, this was interesting. Um, S6K um, promotes the production of fat cell, and so if you block this S6K, then you reduce the you, you reduce the, um, uh, production of new fat cells. Um, and then this uh, 4E BP1 uh, is involved in insulin signaling. And so at low dose rapamycin, you don't mess with that. At high dose, you do. Um, and so that, again, it's a balancing act. You have to find the right dose, and that's what we're about uh, with the study. Um, and then uh, Professor uh, Kameline at the um, University of Washington, he's, he's uh, become famous for um, the dog aging trial uh, study. And he, um, he basically says that rapamycin increases lifespan by 10 to 30 percent in multiple strains of mice, uh, and uh, Dr. Black Oskloni, he's one of our advisors uh, and uh, has, has donated generously as well to uh, to, to the um, uh, to the Pearl trial. Frapamycin mechanism of action does not slow down aging. Then everything we know about it, biology is wrong. So we've got a lot uh, riding on this trial. <laughs> um, again, a little bit more about rapamycin. You know, it has to do with cell growth, cell survival, metabolism, autophagy. Um, and then there are some other things as well uh, with the TORC1, you know, improved neurological function. And here's some, you know, here's some of the studies, um, reversal of, of age-related cardiac dysfunction, immune dysfunction, um, you know, physical activity. And I had the last few slides are, are, are um, about, there's about uh, 30 or so um, um, resources um, that, that we've um, uh, scoured in order to, uh, to come up with all this information. So in mice, it increases lifespan, improves bone and, and cardiovascular health. Um, you know, in dogs, uh, you know, they share the same environment we live in, you know, man's best friend, uh, but they age seven to times faster, seven to 10 times faster. But the, um, the interesting thing about them is they seem to be affected, domestic dogs anyway, seem to be affected by similar aging, age-related diseases as us cancer, heart disease, diabetes, things like that. Um, and then uh, there was an article, I believe, back in the summer uh, on this BBC Science Focus that uh, focused on the dog aging product uh, project. It's a large um, 80,000 dog and growing um, uh, dog, you know, uh, trial to look at, it's a trial, a project to look at uh, dog aging. And I think they're in the process of enrolling. I, have, I haven't looked at their updates in a while, but they're in the process of enrolling about 500 dogs to look at rapamycin. Um, in humans, there, there, there have been a few trials and they look, they look promising. Um, 
and you've got, um, you know, reduces cell, uh, cellular senescence and improves histological signs of aging in the skin. I think that has to do with topical rapamycin, um, which, which is something we might actually be offering in the near future. Um, and then um, they're interesting, uh, a rapalog uh, actually improved influenza vaccine response by 20% in elderly population. Uh, I believe that was um, uh, Joan Mannick's work, um, Dr. Mannick's work. Um, the uh, RTB 101, you know, and, and of course, what's a, a presentation these days without mentioning COVID, um, you know, and, and uh, Joan Mannix is uh, quoted for saying that in phase two studies, this uh, rapalog was observed to upregulate uh, innate antiviral gene expression and therefore has a potential to be pan antiviral immunotherapy. And uh, there was um, there was talk of studying uh, of, uh, this rapalog in um, um, preventing COVID-19. I'm not sure what came of the study. Um, unfortunately, um, I believe uh, Restore Bio um, was purchased by uh, Adaset, I believe is, is how you pronounce it, um, not too long ago, I think a few months ago. And I'm not even sure what the fate of the Rapalog is. And there's a couple other companies that have come and unfortunately gone um, uh, that, that that were developing Rapalogs uh, and it, it, it um, the story's not over, though. I'm sure that we're going to see a lot more come up, especially as you know, uh, we, we see more and more uh, interest in, in rapologs and aging, uh, especially if, if, if companies can uh, uh, or, or, or lobbyist companies, uh, organizations can uh, um, uh, convince the FDA to, to recognize aging as a disease. Um, And then, um, you know, like I said, I mean, there, there doesn't be any shortage of people who, who you know, who self-experiment, self-medicate, um, but it has to, it, you, you have, we feel it has to be done correctly and safely. Um, you know, my hat goes out to people who, who've tried it on their own uh, very, through various different channels, um, you know, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, our study design, um, four dosing schedules, uh, we're looking mainly for uh, both safety and efficacy. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So our phase one, we'll, we'll, we're targeting 375 participants, plus or minus. Um, I think the minimum number we need is about 200, 250 in order to, to get good data, you know, decent data out of it. Uh, but if we can get to our full 375 or more, that would be great. It all comes down to funding. We'll talk a little about that towards the end as well. Um, once we determine the safety and potential, uh, you know, the, the safety and efficacy of, of uh, the one or more of the doses. We're hoping that one dose will stick out and we can move on to that dose uh, into a, you know, a larger trial, maybe up to a thousand or more. Um, and then uh, you know, look, at, look at rapamycin in combination. It's possible rapamycin along with metformin or some other therapy, uh, uh, nutrient, something would, would be much more effective or synergistic, but it's, pos it's possible the other way around. Maybe you don't want to take metformin and rapamycin. Maybe you're, um, you're inhibiting mTOR too much. Uh, or maybe you know I have to alter the dose, so we're not quite sure yet. Like I said, as far as I know, there there aren't any studies on metformin rapamycin. All right, so here's a little bit of um, new news, just kind of hot off the uh, press today. If you look at our original protocol, we we um, we adjusted one of the dosings. Uh, so originally we had 1.5 milligrams uh, three days a week as a, as as one of our dosing protocols. We actually removed that in favor of a 10 milligram once a week. Uh, this is based on the feedback from some of our advisors. Uh, and, uh, and, and some of the community as well. Uh, so we think a lot of people will be pleased uh, for the inclusion of that 10 milligram once a week. Um, and of course, you know, what, what's a good trial without a placebo? Um, study population, um, the, you know, there's a bunch of, you know, inclusion criteria, you know, age, um, you know, um, and basically, you know, you have to be willing and able to participate. Um, exclusion, uh, we have several here listed. Um, We've decided to exclude um, uh, any any pre premenopausal females. Um, basically, you know, if if, if uh, women are still in their menopausal years, they won't be able to uh, participate. Sorry, um, and there's a few others as well. Um, and we, we've we've carefully selected this list, as, you know, to to make sure we don't um, have any unwanted side effects or or, or or cause any of these things to be worse. Um, so we have primary endpoints and we have secondary endpoints. Uh, we've decided that a primary endpoint will be change in visceral fat by DEXA scan. Um, the reason for that is um, our RPI, Dr. Watson actually did a, a small scale um, rapamycin trial. 
uh, where he looked at various different biomarkers and, and, and uh, what, what kind of stood out was this reduction in visceral fat. And it's considered to be like a clinical endpoint as well. Um, so, so not only do we know that arpamycin seems to help with it based on previous data, but like I said, it's kind of a, a, a you know, you can't use, you know, methylation clock as a, as an end, as a clinical endpoint. You, you have to have, you have to have something a little bit more, um, uh, I don't, I'm not sure what the term to use for that. Um, I, um, and then secondary endpoints, uh, you know, we'd be looking at, uh, fat lean, ch uh, body changes, adverse reactions, obviously when it comes to safety. Um, and then, um, you know, our objectives. So we have several objectives with this trial. Uh, objective number one is, is, is to just look at the safety um, of, of rapamycin um, and study it in, in healthy adults looking to take it for aging. Um, we'll be looking at um, uh, health surveys uh, as well as, uh, you know, blood panels. Um, you know, patients may ask about side effects and things like that. We'll be, um, you know, watching for changes in renal function, liver enzymes, glucose dysregulation, electrolyte disturbances, changes to the uh, blood counts. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, you know, uh, changes in lipid composition. Um, and then uh, side effects, you know, the, um, the, the side effect that seeps, seems to come up over and over again is uh, mouth ulcer, somatitis. Um, and um, that seems to be fairly common, especially early on. Um, from what I've heard, it's not, I mean, it's, it's annoying, uh, but not, not dangerous. Uh, and, and we're hoping, you know, just a little bit of mouthwash or, or maybe a, a, a gel of some sort might be able to mitigate that. Um, but also reported as, you know, nausea, diarrhea, and then impaired wound healing is another potential. Again, that could be dose dependent. Um, and that's part of the reason why if, if you're scheduled for surgery in the next six to 12 months, um, or then we ask that you, you know, uh, maybe join us uh, later during phase two. Um, more seriously, I mean, if you, if you, if you Google Mayo Clinic Sirolimus side effects, Sirolimus is the uh, drug name for rapamycin, you'll see a, a long, long list. Um, and, and, and part of the reason is, again, because of the dosing. And the other thing is because of the patient population. I mean, I mean, up until recently, you know, rapamycin mostly been used in really sick patients. Um, but um, from our perspective, it seems like what we need to look out for is potentially an increased susceptibility to infections like pneumonia, soft tissue. Um, so we'll be watching for these closely. Uh, all right, and then objective two is to look at um, efficacy from a longevity standpoint. Um, and this is where we're kind of looking at like uh, biophysical endpoints. Um, Somebody asked about methylation clock in the chat. Yes, that's that's going to definitely going to be a big thing for us. We'll be looking at a whole panel of things, as as many things as we can kind of get our hands on, um, and as we can afford to look at, and and obviously, and as as is practical. I mean, if it's if we're, you know this is a completely remote trial, so obviously we're not going to be able, be able to go around and get biopsies from people, not not easily anyway. Uh, but we can do you know uh, DEXA scans, send some people to, you know send people to, to various different centers to do DEXA scan, blood work, uh, urine, uh, stool, things like that. And there's a whole variety of tests we want to we want to run, and I'll and I'll I'll spend a few minutes talking about those tests. So a Dexa, uh, you know, Dexa scan. We have a partner, DexaFit. They have about about 25 and growing locations around the country. Hopefully, most people will be within driving distance. If not, uh, we can work to try to find another body composition um, center that would give us uh, the information that we're looking for. Um, and then, like I said, our primary is this VAT, you know, vis visceral adipose tissue. It's the hidden fat around the organs. You know, here's a little. Um, um, little, uh, you know, uh, representation, representation, a little picture of it. Um, and we talked a little bit about the why. Uh, but of course, you know, for those who don't know what visceral fat is, you know, it's been, you know, excess visceral fat has been linked to type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, inflammatory disease, you know, and the list kind of goes on and on. It seems like every day we're, we're linking something new to visceral adipose tissue. Uh, and, and shrinking that, that visceral adipose tissue is not an easy task. And so in and of itself, if we were able to succeed just in that one marker, I think that would be a good thing because it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and then uh, we'll be looking, part of the efficacy as well is, is kind of like well-being surveys. You know, the, these are standardized surveys. Um, like the WOMAC and the SF36, um, just asking a bunch of questions about, you know, function, um, uh, mood, energy, things like that. All right, let's get to some of the uh, science here. So somebody asked about methylation clock. Um, um, now, this is kind of a hot topic in the in the field of aging. A lot of companies are working on these, um, and basically, uh, you can you can get uh, the, the DNA from either uh, blood cells 
or from saliva. Um, and uh, we're, we're actually hoping to, to look at both. Um, some of the newer chips can look at up to 900,000 CPG sites. And then there are, seems like every day there's a new algorithm to, to analyze these. Um, a little bit about DNA methylation for those people who don't know. Basically, DNA is considered to be di digital. You know, you've got the ACT and G. That doesn't really change. We thought maybe that, that degraded or changes with aging. It doesn't really seem to change all that much. I mean, obviously, you can have DNA damage and things like that. Um, but, but the main driver of aging seems to be methylation patterns, um, or one of the main drivers, I should say. Uh, that's kind of the analog noise. Um, uh, if, you, if you listen to, to Dr. David Sinclair, he talks about you know, uh, uh, a CD versus a CD reader. Um, you know, the laser being kind of the analog and the, uh, the, 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 the data, on, you know, the digital data on the CD is, is like the DNA. Um, and DNA methylation is, uh, you know, uh, helps regulate gene expression, um, cell differentiation as well. You know, it's what tells a lung cell to be a lung cell and a heart cell to be a heart cell. It seems like as you get older, uh, you, you, th this, this starts to fall apart and you start getting too much uh, epigenetic and methylation based noise. Uh, and so anything you can do to, 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 to reduce that noise and um, increase the signal seems to help uh, with, the, with the aging, either slow down the aging process or even potentially reverse it. Um, we don't think we'll be able to reverse it just yet, not with rapamycin or metformin, uh, but, um, well, not, not significantly. I mean, not to the point where we can make humans live past 120, uh, but I think we can, we can slow it down and, and maybe um, reverse some of the damage that's already been done. Um, there were, um, Dr. Watson um, uh, completed the TRIM trial, uh, the, also known as the thymus regeneration trial, and uh, using metformin, growth hormone, and DHEA therapy, was actually showed that uh, you can reverse the epigenetic methylation clock using those three therapies. And there's a, an ongoing uh, trial to expand that right now. We might be involved in something like that down the line. We haven't we haven't quite decided yet. Um, you know the uh, kind of the father of these methylation clocks, Dr. Hor Steve Horvath. Um, you know his original algorithm looks at 353 uh, CPG sites. Like I said, there's some algorithms out there, algorithms out there that look like um, uh, look you know that look at you know a few you know anywhere from a few hundred to several hundred thousand. Like I said, some of the newer chips go up to 900,000. Um, and there's custom chips and things like that. So, um, We've also uh, spoken to Dr. Levine. Um, she was at UCLA, I believe now she's at Yale. She's kind of come up with this um, phenotypic age clock that merges uh, some blood biomarkers uh, along with um, uh, the CPG clocks to estimate aging. Um, and like I said, it seems like every day somebody's introducing a new clock. I think she just came out with a new clock. I, I can't remember if she renamed it, um, but... Um, uh, but I have not had a chance yet to look at it. I've been busy uh, <laughs> working on this. Um, and, now, and, and the other thing we'll be looking at uh, is in a potentially experimental uh, assessment of mTOR and autophagy. Um, uh, James Cl uh, Clement at uh, Better Humans, um, he's offered us to, to look at, at, at uh, various different markers of autophagy and uh, mTOR activity. I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet, um, but, um, but we're hoping to bank the samples as well so that uh, you know, when his lab is ready, we can send those off and analyze the data. Um, another interesting test is um, glycosylation of immunoglobulins. The commercially available one is Glycanage, developed by a professor, Gordon, uh, I believe, Lowak or Locke, I, forgive me if I mispronounce it. Um, but basically the idea is that um, um, as you get older, you, the methylation, sorry, the glycosylation pattern of uh, immunoglobulins change. And there seems to be a correlation we're not sure what the cause is uh, yet, um, but but it does seem like as you get older, um, the uh, glycation pattern becomes uh, messier and noisier. Um, uh, actually, it's the other way around. Becomes uh, you you start losing glycosylation, uh, and then of course microbiome. Uh, microbiome is still you know still big big topic. Um, you know we're we're hoping to collect stool samples from patients and look to see if rapamycin uh, has any uh, consequence. Uh, one way or the other on uh, uh, the microbiome. Um, keep in mind, uh, rapamycin was originally isolated to be used as an antifungal. You know, bacteria, you know, bacterial warfare, <laughs> microbiome warfare is, is kind of one of the arsenal of this, of this bacteria that was isolated from. So, so we think that'll have a favorable effect, but we won't know until we look. Um, and then our final objective, or one of our final objectives, is actually roll out rapamycin therapy. Like I mentioned before, we've had a lot of interest in it. 
it's just there's just not enough data, not from a safety safety perspective, not even from a dosing perspective, actually prescribe it currently. Um, you know, the few physicians that do, it's it's you know they're they're, they're brave, <laughs> um, braver than I am in terms of you know uh, prescribing it. Um, and uh, but we're hoping that this this trial will give us the the data that we need uh, to, to confidently prescribe uh, and, and and confidently prescribe the right dose, the correct dose. Um, and then, uh, like I said, the rollout, uh, expand the number of participants, uh, and then and then look at you know uh, combination. Um, and then there's another um, uh, quote from uh, Professor Kimmelin. Um Not only does it increase lifespan, but also delays or even reverses nearly every age-related disease or decline in function, which has been uh, tested in mice, rats, and companion dogs. Uh, and the, and and the, the list is pretty long here. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about funding here. So, uh, you know, trials can be can be um, rather expensive if anybody's you know familiar with with the with the funding of, of clinical trials. I mean, uh, you know, a new a new drug can cost you know a billion to two billion dollars to bring to market. Uh, we're not looking to bring a new market the drug. I mean, rapamycin is already an FDA approved one, um, and so that kind of limits because we're not bringing a new drug to market. It's not patentable. Um, we're not really looking to patent it either. You know, that kind of eliminates, you know, big pharma and biotech funding. Um, and because we're kind of rolling this out, um, you know, um, uh, on, on a commercial scale, um, you know, ac ac academic, you know, we are talking to academic, you know, university labs to help us with some of the um, uh, testing and things like that. Uh, but that we're, we're not necessarily relying on them for a large source. And then grants are just government grants. You know, the NIH just doesn't want to fund um, uh, anti-aging studies, longevity studies. I mean, um, uh, I mean, look at uh, the TAME trial. Uh, Dr. Barzilai has been, uh, you know, trying to fund that that that, that, that trial for 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 years now, um, and and he keeps hitting. You know, I think he's finally gotten some funding for it, but but it's not. It, it's not a uh, it's not a slam dunk, obviously. Um, so that leaves um, private donors such as uh, such as Asia Sarx. We're chipping in. Um, you know, um, also we've also had several uh, uh, general uh, generous um, donors and crowdfunding. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then part of it, uh, we're hoping that our participants will also chip in um, for you know to offset some of the cost. This is, by the way, a total cost, uh, it's, um, and it, and we can definitely get started with a much lower number than that. Um, this is a little bit of a breakdown. You know, we we think that the um, medication itself will cost. You know, this is per. per per participant for the entire 12 months, about $300 there. If you want to run, you know, a lot of the lab tests, about $1,500, you know, some of the other tests, you know, the methylation clocks and things like that, 1,500 or more, depending on how many and what, what type, you know, we have, you know, staffing costs, banking costs. Um, so all together, you know, we, we think that, you know, the trial will cost about $300 per month per, per patient. However, um, uh, because of various donations and other other things that we're doing to be a little bit creative with cost cutting, um, we think we can. Uh, we're, we're 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 targeting a um, cost to the participant of um, one hundred and twenty dollars. We did a survey, and that seems to be a a, a, a level where most participants um, are are um, um, willing and able to um, to help us out with. Um, and then you know just uh, you know when when somebody enrolls, they'll be asked to put a, a you know. A, a, deposit for the first three months. Um, all right, so what it'll get as a participant? Uh, blood work, <laughs> obviously. Um, you know, first we want to limit, you know, determine eligibility. Um, you know, we want to verify that you don't have uncontrolled diabetes or any of the, any of the other things that would exclude you. Uh, and then, um, you know, like I said, for baseline data, but also for safety monitoring. Uh, and then um, we're also going to use this data for, uh, for some of the bioage calculators out there, like the, like the Morgan Levine phenoage we talked about. There's a few others. Um, uh, we're, we're talking to an organization called Giro, and they they have they've developed one, and Silico has developed another one. Um, and then this can be the done, you know, some of this can be done at your local doctor's office, and we'll talk, you know, you'll, you'll we'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Our our coordinators will talk to you a little bit more about that when you when you kind of uh, move forward on enrolling, uh, and or send out mobile phlebotomists. It'll likely be a mix. Some of it'll be done at your doctor's office or, or local lab. Some will be done by mobile phlebotomists, just because some of these testing. Specialized and requires specialized uh, processing, and uh, and and then you know uh, trans tra to transport to our to our uh, biobank, uh, you know, and then you know, like I said, because of our our, our primary endpoint has to do with the uh, visceral fat, um, we'll you know we'll be sending it to either a DEXA fit location or somewhere else that can measure. Not every DEXA scanner has a software on it to do body composition, uh, so so if, if you're not near a DEXA fit, we are going to have to do a little homework. Um, 
it, it, it should be fine though. I, I think there are several places where we can send people. Um, and, and the DEXA scan looks for visceral fat, obviously it gives you total bone density, um, not, not the diagnostic bone density scan that, that you would you would get if you're you know being screened for osteoporosis and then you know lean lean body mass uh, fat mass as well and then the dosage you know um, um, it's a double blind trial meaning I don't know what dose you're gonna get Carlo doesn't know what you what dose you're gonna get um, and uh, you know and then you won't know what dose <laughs> you're gonna get either um, well obviously you know you'll know based on you know you'll, you'll you'll have a pretty good idea but you won't know whether you're in the placebo group or not um, and, and that's by design. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, Dr. Z, why do you need a placebo? You know, everybody should be on rapamycin. And, and, and I agree. I think everybody should eventually be if, if, it, if it shows, um, uh, if it, if it shows uh, enough promise in it. Um, but, you know, you can't underestimate the, the, the power of the placebo effect. Uh, I mean, um, uh, when, especially when it comes to, you know, when, when we're looking at the SF36 and the Womack, I mean, uh, placebo can, can really skew those. Um, and so we need, we need, we need the placebo uh, group in order, you know, they're, they're important. They're, they're arguably our most important group is the placebo group, uh, to kind of, um, really kind of, uh, um, tease out which effects are, are placebo, uh, which effects are, 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 you know, the real rapamycin and it just makes it for a much more scientifically rig rigorous, uh, experiment. Um, so, um, you know, ethical dilemma is a placebo, you know, obviously if there's a, you know, a clear approved treatment, you know, some, some cancer trials, for example, skip the placebo. Um, and, um, um, and then in terms of, um, so HSRX, we, we've uh, decided we're going to pay for all the capsules. And so nobody's actually paying for placebo capsules. Um, you know, the participant, um, participant, uh, partic you know, the funding from participants will be used for the blood work and staffing and things like that, not for the actual capsules. So that kind of hopefully gets around that ethical dilemma. Uh, and the other thing we're, we're promising, if, if you turn out, if you're a participant and you turn out to be in the placebo group, we're actually going to offer you rapamycin at no charge for phase two for full year. Uh, sorry, thank you to you who are brave enough <laughs> to be in our trial. Um, and, you know, why participate? Um, you know, bragging rights, you know, you can say that you help move rapamycin forward and, you know, and rapamycin is just the beginning. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to encourage this, this idea of citizen scientists, like, like I mentioned, uh, Dr. Barzlai had, had encouraged as well. Um, and then, you know, we're going to be doing analyses and things like that, that you really won't find anywhere else. Um, like I said, the autophagy, the mTOR, you know, you know, I, I don't want to make any promises because it's not a done deal yet. Um, we're still waiting for uh, better humans to uh, to verify that that's something they can run for us right now. But you know, like I said, there'll be a, a lot of experimental algorithms in terms of the methylation clocks and things like that. And then also, uh, you know, um, uh, it'll allow us to offer um, uh, rapamycin, um, uh, and and you'll be able to hopefully participate in um, uh, in future trials as well. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, there'll be a lot of bonus analysis, things really you won't be able to find anywhere else. Uh, we're even doing, we're even talking on doing um, proteomics and metabolomics as well. And again, that's something that's just not easily available. Um, but the caveat here is, you know, the, the cost that I mentioned uh, um, is only the base cost, you know, the, the DEXA scan, the, the blood, you know, some of the blood work, things like that. Uh, but we can only do extra tests if we raise enough money to fund them. And that's kind of, um, I'll talk about funding a little bit more, fundraising a little bit more. Uh, so what are the steps? Step one, if you're interested and, uh, and you, you, you qualify, uh, you, you email us. Um, Carlo and one of, his, um, uh, one of his associates, one of his uh, assistants will, um, will, will, will get back to you and, and help you with uh, the pre -screen, you know, screening and pre-screening, consenting, enrollment, uh, all the baseline evaluations that we talked about. Um, and then, uh, you know, if everything kind of moves forward, uh, then you'll do a uh, video consultation either myself or if, or if we have other clinical investigators on board. And then at that point, after, you know, all the consents are signed electronically and things like that, uh, we'll have the pharmacy or partner pharmacy ship out the uh, rapamycin or placebo. Um, and then ongoing, uh, you've got week, uh, you know, week two and four, you've got, you know, we're always going to be asking you about side effects. Um, you know, with surveys and things like that. Of course, if, if anybody has a side effect, they want to report, you know, email, phone, um, the best way to report it. And then, you know, blood work, uh, week 12, um, you know, some of the same plus the uh, the questionnaire and then month six and 12, um, basically all, all these things plus uh, a repeat uh, DEXA scan and, um, you know, um, 
a repeat a lot of the a lot of the baseline, the blood work, the stool test, the uh, the, the DEXA, the um, uh, methylation test, things like that. And then you know the questions come up. You know I'm already on rapamycin through you know either like an online pharmacy of some sort or you know or, or some other source. Uh, great. Um, email us also. Uh, we're putting together a patient registry, um, and I think it'll help us um, um, collect valuable uh, data as well as uh, real world use data. Um, you know there's a lot of people out there using various different dosing schedules. Um, you know that that would also provide um, uh, valuable information on that as well. Um, we, we just a, a, a just a touch on a higher dose. So we, like I said, we, we decided to add a 10 milligram once a week dose uh, based on feedback from our community and some of our advisors. Um, but we've also been advised maybe to look at the 20 milligram once a week dose. Um, you know, the benefits to that, obviously, it might be more powerful. You know, maybe some of the advocates are right. Um, you know, weekly dosing obviously is is is, is ideal because it's less expensive, uh, easier to you know you just take it like on a Sunday, every Sunday. Um, however, there's some drawbacks. It's uncomfortably it's a, it's an uncomfortably high dose. The FDA lists the maximum dose of 40 milligrams at any given time, any given day. So 20 milligrams, I mean, it's 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 still half of that, but it's not a quarter of it, for example. Um, so that's kind of pushing. You know, and that that's the maximum dose. That's not that's not the common dose usually used for rapamycin or Um, You know, the all the other worry is if you know if we start having some more serious side effects, that 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 could, you know, terminate our trial, and that would be that would be bad. Um, and then you know, obviously, if we start looking at all, only weekly doses, we'll never know whether you know two times a week or three times a week. You know, the dog the drug trials are looking at three times a week, I believe some of the dog trials are. I know I've been told that uh, dogs uh, metabolize uh, rapamycin a little bit more quickly, so you may not necessarily really compare it, but if we don't study it, we won't really know. Uh, but so our compromise is that, um, you know, for people who do, um, who do tolerate the rapamycin the best, we can then go on uh, maybe six, probably 12 months uh, from now, take those, take some volunteers and, and do a dose escalation, maybe look at 15 milligrams, uh, 18 milligrams, 20. Um, and then and just kind of do more frequent testing, do more frequent monitoring. Um, I, we, we just feel that, that the 20 milligram dose would, would be asking for trouble right now. Um, why, you know, why is it important to participate as well? I mean, this is a, this is, we consider this to be a groundbreaking trial. It's the first large scale uh, clinical trial assessing the safety and efficacy of uh, rapamycin uh, for, for longevity, um, but it's only a beginning. I mean, like I said, we, we wanna kind of build the infrastructure to, um, uh, to, to start looking at uh, other therapies as well. Um, you know, there's, there's so many other promising therapies out there, um, but there's just seems to be so little data. Uh, you know, somebody needs to study it on a, on a, on a, on a very systemic basis. Um, the, the, you know, the old paradigm shift, anybody's familiar with, uh, you know, new drug coming to, you know, coming to market, um, you know, new molecule is patentable, usually it's single molecule focus. Um, but it's very, very expensive, anywhere between half a billion to, to, uh, to upwards of $2, $2 billion. The median is almost, you know, just shy of a billion dollars. And it takes time, 12 years on average, super high failure rate, only about five out of 5,000 molecules enter preclinical. Of the five that, that make it to preclinical, only one of those five get approved. So that, that's a huge failure rate there. And of course, you know, to make up for all the expense and all the risk and all, you know, all, all the rest of that, they have to price the drug really, really high. It's not, it's not that the that the new drug costs very, you know, it costs very much. You know, a lot of times new drugs cost just as much as generic drugs to to produce. Um, but it's 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 all the rest of this um, that that you have to make up the cost for. So new drug can be anywhere between five hundred to ten thousand dollars per month. Um, and just as just one one treatment, um, so so we're kind of looking at it at a different way. Uh, our new model is kind of looking at off patent uh, or or molecules that are soon to be off patent. Um, there are some some good ones uh, that are that are coming off patent uh, in the next few years. Um, you know, relatively inexpensive. I mean, metformin is a good example. I mean, I mean, all in on our platform right now. If you, if you want a metformin prescription, you know, it's 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 really you know fairly inexpensive. Um, time efficient, instead of 12 years, you know, we might be able to get some answers in 12 months. Um, and then, you know, we don't have to go through, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, that's why our trial is considered to be phase four, because it's, it, we're not really seeking a new approval. We're kind of looking at a different use for an existing drug. Um, uh, but, you know, but that means an already approved off-patent has 
you know, metformin has a ton of data, rapamycin has a good amount of data, you know, being around for, for 20 years or so now. Um, and then, you know, our focus is on making the prescription widely available. Um, whereas, you know, biotech companies, you know, I, I, I respect them. I have a lot of respect for them and their, you know, the challenges they go through and, and all the risks that they take. But at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times they're just focused on single molecules. Um, you know, and we're, 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 we're focusing on a single molecule right now, rapamycin, but in the future that, you know, we, you know, you're, we're not going to solve aging with any one molecule. I mean, I mean, that's the chance of that happening is, 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 is extremely remote. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's going to take a combination and we're not even sure what that combination is yet. There's a lot of hypotheses and things like that, but we won't really know until we start testing. And of course, you know, encourages, you know, encourages, you know, webinars like this, <laughs> um, participations from, from citizen scientists, people who, um, who are enthusiastic and want to step up um, and combinations, as a, you know, combination, combination. So what can you do to help? Um, you know, uh, we're um, direct monetary contributions, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be launching a crowdfunding uh, and spreading the word. Um, our crowdfunding is through the um, Life Extension Advocacy Foundation. Um, thank you for um, for hosting that for us. Uh, it's not live yet. Uh, we hope to have it live. Don't quote me on this. By the end of the month, um, maybe early February. Um, but you know, people asking, you know, when, you know, what do you do with that money? I've kind of already talked about it a little bit. Uh, the more we raise, the more we can do. Uh, the idea is that, um, like, here, here's an example. For example, uh, here's an example. Um, you have microbiome tests. If we wanted to run three samples on all 375 participants at around $250 per sample, including analysis and things like that. It'll cost us, you know, you know, $280,000. You know, if we want to do proteomics, that's a little bit higher price tag. Um, now, obviously, I mean, we're not going to, we're not going to necessarily need to run all the tests on all the subset, you know, all the samples. We could, we could be very um, uh, economic with it and just, just take subsets uh, of samples, uh, see what see what shows and maybe expand it um and that you know and that and that's to be cognizant of the funds um and and to make sure we use them as wisely as possible obviously the more that we have you know the more that we raise the more we can do and the better the insights the better the data um, um one thing one thing i didn't mention about the methylation clocks we've been told by several people in the in the, in the field that we may not necessarily see any changes with the um with the blood-based um, DNA methylation clocks. And that's, that's based on the opinion from Dr. Horvath himself, as well as uh, preliminary results from, from a 30-person rapamycin trial that, that's underway right now. Um, and, so, and so that kind of highlights the importance of um, looking at different tests, not just relying on one test. And that's why we're trying to look at as many tests as we, as we can get our hands on, because uh, you know, we're not optimistic we're going to see any changes to the methylation clock. And I'm going to say that up front. You know, we've been, we've been warned. But we need to run it anyway because people ask us why we're trying to blood-based methylation clock. That's kind of become almost the gold standard. Um, however, you know, um, you know, might be, you know, for example, DHEA, for example, that was part of the TRIM trial. That seems to consistently change the DNA methylation clock. I'm not quite sure what the mechanism of action there. Maybe somebody in the biochemistry community can kind of enlighten me on that. Um, but that goes to show that some therapies might affect one aspect of, of uh, these biomarkers and another therapy might affect another aspect. Um, and so we, that, that kind of highlights the, uh, um, the um, that kind of highlights the, uh, um, uh, the, the importance of looking at many different aspects. And again, down the line, when we start looking at different therapies, combination therapies, we need a lot more holistic view rather than telomeres. Like for example, there was that hyperbaric oxygen uh, uh, trial that, that, that just uh, got, got published, look, you know, that it improved telomere length. Well, we're not sure. I mean, is, is, does, that, does that actually translate to longevity or is that just one measure? You know, we, we don't know. Um, so, so, so that kind of highlights the importance of why we need to raise the funds in order to look at more, more, more of these. And like I said, preparing for the future, we're hoping to build an infrastructure here, not just a, not just a single trial. Um, and then it'll feed into our telemedicine offering, allow us to offer a lot more uh, therapies down the line. Um, and then just a kind of a quick thank you for everybody who's um, either, you know, either. Uh, We've spoken to, discussed. Uh, these are potential collaborator, correct, uh, collaborators. Um, I apologize if I missed anybody on this list, um, but you know we've been talking to a lot of people, uh, and we've really, we've greatly appreciated the uh, the input from 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 everybody. I mean, it's it's been a great journey getting us here uh, to where we're at today, and I, I think the uh, the fun is only beginning to start. 
Um, there's a couple of references. Uh, th these references are pulled from our protocol. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Dr. Zink, thank you. And I believe uh, Dr. James Watson hopped on at some point during the call. Is Dr. Watson still in the audience? Might have dipped in and dipped out, so. All right, so Dr. Z, thank you so much for taking the time to kind of go through your slide deck and being quite thorough and timely. We actually have 10 more minutes than I thought we would. All right. <laughs> Based on the slides that you have. Um, I've been a little bit proactive inside responding to the uh, queries through the chat. Could you go ahead and switch over to the eligibility slide with the inclusion criteria for me, Dr. Um, sure. Let me see if I can get back to that quickly here. Hold thank you. And then while you do that, you were referencing a study, uh, was it with uh, Dr. Clement with the 30 rapamycin trial that's currently underway or was there another study you were referencing? Uh, there's another organization. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I want to, if I can talk about that publicly or not, but um, um, it was just a, a, a colleague who kind of mentioned some preliminary data, very preliminary data. And like I said, that, 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 that kind of uh, echoes a lot of data sets that, that Steve Horvath and other, other people in the, um, you know, who've looked at methylation clock data for rapamycin, whether it be humans, rats, other organization, uh, other organisms, published, non-published. Um, so so we're, we're obviously we're gonna be looking at the methylation clock, but for blood-based methylation, we're not, we're not very hopeful we'll find, we might, Maybe if we maybe at a certain doses. Um, however, um, uh, saliva-based uh, may be different. Um, there might be something about the um, um, the epithelial cells um, that that uh, might where their DNA methylation patterns might uh, respond differently than um, than white blood cells. Thank you. Um, I'm going through the queries, and I think I've hit most of these. Dr. Z, if you can kind of go into detail around the extension of the trial once we kind of come to a dose that we feel comfortable with and what we would do for individuals that are currently on the placebo arm, and then also what does phase two kind of look like as we scale up to that thousand participant size? So um, let's see here, where was that? Anyway, um, so well, let me put the inclusion slide because I think a lot of people wanted the inclusion exclusion. Um, basically, um, we, we want a... Um, we want more data on on the dose that seems to be more promising, uh, and and obviously the best way to get more data is to to, to have more participants, uh, and so we're we're hoping that one data will sorry one one dosing schedule will stick out as being superior to the others. We're not sure. I mean, obviously because nobody's really looked, um, but if that turns out to be the case, um, you know, if it doesn't and all four, you know, seem to, to work just fine, then then we'll just have to pick one and go with it. Um, uh, but the idea is that we we we, we want to that the phase two will help us um, uh, bring one step closer to actually start offering it um, uh, to to a wider public. Uh, so so the idea is to, like I said, pick one data. We won't necessarily need a placebo at that point. Um, sorry, pick one dose. We won't need a placebo, and then we can we can just continue monitor um, uh, a larger group of, of patients to look for. I mean, look look for <laughs> things that may not have come up on the smaller uh, study. Thank you. What just came in is about folks that are eligible to likely end up in the registry. And it's around folks who are already kind of self-medicating or self-dosing with rapamycin and how can they get involved and participate. And it's going to be through the mechanism of the registry that we're also producing in parallel for the trial. And that registry has a couple of purposes. Folks that are currently on rapamycin, folks that are international that have been uh, utilizing rapamycin themselves that are not eligible to you know, pull themselves off the product for a few months and then join us locally for the testing. So we are developing a robust real world data observational registry to kind of keep inclusive of everyone who wants to contribute from the citizen science components for this community. Um, for future phases, do we have any interest on modifying the exclusion criteria, Dr. Z, or that's a pretty uh, consistent as we go from phase one to phase two of this trial? Um, I think there was a question was about bringing the age down to 40. Um, was well, there's a couple tricky things with bringing it down to 40. Uh, first of all, we would probably have to exclude most women from that because I believe rapamycin is um, not 
safe for pregnancy. Um, so women in, in that 40 to 50 age group, uh, it'd be a little bit more complicated. Uh, the other thing is um, there's some thought that, that um, like for example, take senolytics. Um, when you're young, senescent cells might be protective based on, based on some of the, you know, some of the experts I've heard speak on that field. But when you're older, um, you know, they, they, they start to work against you. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I can't really answer that question right now. I, I suspect we probably always keep something like rapamycin at, a, at an older age. Um, um, you know, whereas, for example, metformin might be just fine uh, because it's not, it's, it's not nearly as strong of an mTOR inhibitor as, uh, as rapamycin. Um, and it's and you know rap, metformin, for example, is used extensively in younger 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 people. Uh, you know, fertility clinics, weight loss clinics, things like that. Uh, even younger diabetics, I think. Um, so, I don't I don't know. I, I actually have to, to 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 do a little bit more reading on that. Um, but fifty is, seems to be the age where um, aging seems to accelerate. Um, although that that could just be an arbitrary number. Um, so to answer the question, no, I don't. I don't think we're going to go down to forty. Not with rapamycin. I would suggest that the trial is really curated to be a telemedicine decentralized trial. If there was potential to have more site of care post pandemic, more engaged with local facilities that can help with more stringent adverse events reporting, it would provide some flexibility of future studies that we can have more touch points directly with participants. So I think it's one of those growing things that we like to get more involved with, and that's kind of to another individual's question around participation on research collaborations as well, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that we are very open to, Dr. Z. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, we've, we're already collaborating with, with um, a lot of organizations on, on testing and um, also like looking at, at other things to test once, once we kick off rapamycin and things are going well. Uh, can you go into the thoughts on the premenopausal exclusion uh, for Dwayne in the chat? Yeah, like I said, that mostly has to do with um, with with the risk of pregnancy. I mean, uh, because I, I can't remember. I think it, I think rapamycin is either category D or X uh, for pregnancy, so um, that would not be something we'd want to we would want to. Um, it'd, be, it'd be an extra complication we would have to manage for for that age group for women. Um, not not necessarily has anything to do with the menopause with 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 menstruation or anything like like that itself. Um, like I said, I'm not sure if there'll be any benefit for for patients under the age of 50. Uh, like I said, it could be like senolytics where you may actually do harm under a certain age. Or at least we think you'll do harm under a certain age. Again, nobody's really studied senolytics in health, healthy patients. It's just, it's just kind of a um, theory at this point. And I apologize. I saw something about a, a trim trial question, but I can't find it in the chat now that I. Yeah, somebody, I think Ali had asked about um, the trim. Yeah, I mentioned the trim trial and the follow on to is trim X. Um, I think they're expanding it, intervene immune. Uh, we've spoken to intervene immune as well. Uh, we had some discussions about potentially getting involved in a trim or trim like trial. We don't have any, any, any immediate plans to do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think they're, they're, they're currently doing growth hormone, DHEA, and metformin. And like I mentioned, Dr. Watson was the principal investigator on the original TRIM trial. I, I don't think he's involved in the TRIM-X. I think, except for the ones that are popping in now, that we should have been able to hit most of the Q&As. Uh, one of the questions that came in before was, let me just pull it up right over here. how many tests would be involved and how much blood collection would be needed over the entire study. So currently we have a benchmark that you can primarily do with your healthcare provider or we'll work to coordinate a mobile phlebotomist to go to your site. Uh, there's a couple of tests that will be happening throughout the rest of the study, two weeks, four weeks, six months, and 12 months that you might anticipate either collecting your own sample if it's saliva or having mobile phlebotomists going to your house and drawing some peripheral blood. So those are kind of the the touch points that we would have outside of the DEXAFID body scans and the rest of the communication engagements would be done completely remotely online. Um, so thank you for that question beforehand. And I think we might actually end at the right time <laughs> for once. All right. Time. All right. Well, thank well, thank you everybody. Thank, thanks for Car thank you, Carlo, for putting this together. Uh, and thanks for everybody for your interest and in, in showing up this evening. Um,
you know, my, my email is at the end, just basically doctor at AsiusRx, um, you know, research at AsiusRx is the email, uh, uh, all things trial. Um, and um, we hope to see you participate for those who can. All right, thanks everyone. This recording will be provided online on the Perl website and likely the lifespan.io. We'll do a draft of the Q&A with the answers that will be uh, transcribed. And we'll have all the links for the donations when those go live with the interest forms as well. Um, so be sure to keep an eye out on your inbox as well as communication on the websites themselves. So thanks everyone.